It's terrific. Appreciate that so much. Thank you again for allowing me to be here for this great Bible conference. I was looking back in my sermon log, and I may have mentioned this last night, but I think 2002 was the first time I came here. And uh, you've always been so gracious. And Brother Jerry, thank you so much. The uh, first time I preached for Brother Jerry was at New Hope Baptist Church in De Quincey, Louisiana. And uh, I nearly starved to death in the meeting. I would sit down to eat, and it would be crawfish Alfredo. And then I would sit down, and it would be crawfish soup. And if they had not had that snack machine at the Red Oak Inn where I could get me some peanut butter and crackers, I would have starved to death. It's an honor to preach with my son, Josh. He serves on our staff. He's doing a fantastic job uh, just administrating all of our pastoral ministries. He preaches every Wednesday night to a great crowd, and uh, it's an honor uh, to have him here. Uh, all three of our sons, by the grace of God, Josh and uh, Jonathan, our middle son, and Joseph, our youngest son, all three of our sons, and I said, by the grace of God, are in the ministry. And if you were to ask them who is the greatest preacher in our family, they would tell you it's their mother. Uh, I'm telling you what, there were times raising three sons I wanted to give up, but I can remember one incident when one of the boys had been lying, and they were just young, and he had been lying. And uh, my wife was upstairs dealing with him, and I could hear her up there. And uh, now I get such a chuckle when I think about it. I could hear her up there saying, son, son, why are you lying? Are you saved? Son, are you sure you're saved? Don't you know the Bible says that liars shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, that's some good preaching, folks. I, <laughs> I was downstairs taking notes, so uh, glad Lisa's here, too. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with me in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 40. John, chapter 1, and verse 40. And this morning, I'm preaching on this subject, ordinary is extraordinary. Ordinary is extraordinary. From the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and I begin to read in verse 40. And the Bible says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated to stone. Dear God, I ask again that you give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach as a dying man to a dying world. And Lord, I confess the words of John the Baptist who said, I must decrease and you must increase. Lord, I pray that this service will be in the grip of grace and I pray we will experience the manifested presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, I pray I won't struggle for something to say, labor for something to say. I pray you'll put your words on the tip of my tongue. And I pray, God, that we'll be spiritually spellbound and you'll give our hearts ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Several years ago, I had an experience as in a big uh, Bible conference. Uh, lots of uh, major singing groups were there, and a lot of the very well-known uh, pastors were there. And, and people get offended. They only listen to about half what you say, and so they get bent out of shape and offended. So I want to just tell you right up front so that you don't get offended at part of this uh, story I'm getting ready to tell you that I don't have any issue with folks selling stuff like when speakers come to our church, when Brother Bob Pittman comes to our church, we put a table out there, uh, we promote his books. I say these are great resources. They support his ministry. When we have singing groups, we don't put the table in the backyard or something. You know, we put it right out there where you can find it. And I tell the folks for the Lee, please support these folks' ministry. You can take this wonderful Christian music home. I, I want you to know I don't have any problem about selling stuff. I, I just don't have nothing to sell. 
and uh, I've never written a book, you know. So I was in this big Bible conference, and uh, I, I preached my heart out. And after the service, I was kind of just standing around, and this young man kind of came up breathless, and he said, uh, where's your product table? And I said, I, I don't have a product table. He said, well, wh you know, your books, your CDs, where are they? I said, I don't have any books or CDs. He says, you don't have a table? And I said, no, sir, I don't have a table. And he said, oh. He said, so you're just a pastor. I said, yeah, that's right. I'm just a pastor. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to preach somewhere, and after the service, somebody come up to me and say, you know what? That was really a blessing, and you know, I'd never heard of you. You see, we're, we're living in a day and age where there's this perception that unless you are well-known, if you hadn't been on a major news broadcast to comment, if you haven't been on a major Christian television ministry to maybe promote your latest book, that really you have no value to the kingdom of God and what you're doing has no significance. But you know, that's not what the Bible teaches. I found in my study in the scripture that God is building his kingdom with an army of ordinary people. In fact, what the world says is ordinary, God says is extraordinary. What I have found is that God uses these people that the world say unwise, foolish, insignificant. That's the kind of folks that God uses. So I want to show you one of the ordinary folks in the Bible that God used. And I want to really give encouragement to all of us to not spend our life trying to be well known or to be famous, but to just spend our life as an instrument in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, letting our life be a channel of blessing. Andrew is one of these ordinary people, and there are three things I want you to notice about him this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, that he had a shadow ministry, a shadow ministry. All his life, he ministered in the shadow of someone else. First of all, he ministered in the shadow of John the Baptist. We learn earlier in these scriptures that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. One day he heard this great preacher out there preaching his message of repentance, and he was so moved he realized he is pointing us to the true Messiah who is to come. He lived in the shadow of a man who was larger than life. John the Baptist was one of those men who when he came into the room, he took over the room. He is a man who was prophesied in the Old Testament. How do you top that for goodness sakes? He was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb of his mom. How do you top that? He baptized Jesus Christ with his own hands. How on earth could you ever go beyond that? And what a mighty preacher he was. He didn't have a building. He had a terrible location. He was out there in the wilderness of Judea and just preached hellfire and brimstone from daylight till dark. And the people flooded out of the villages and the communities to come out there to hear this man preach. He got one decent pulpit committee, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They came out there to interview him. And he said, you know what? Y'all smell like a newly opened grave. You're nothing but a bunch of snakes. And I wouldn't baptize a one of you till you gave some evidence that you've truly been converted. And they went back to town like scalded dogs. He was a man's man. He slept under the stars. And I want you to know thousands of people flooded to this man and he baptized them in the River Jordan. And in the midst of the crowd was somebody nobody had ever heard of. And his name was Andrew. Just one of the crowd out there overshadowed by this great preacher, John the Baptist. He was also overshadowed by his brother, Peter. When they got saved, uh, Peter became the more prominent one. He became the pastor. He became the leader of the church. In fact, did you notice when it refers to Andrew here, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother in verse 40. That's the way he was introduced. He's mentioned like that more than once in the Bible. Oh, by the way, have you ever met Andrew? You know, you know Simon Peter's brother. I mean, he always lived in the shadow of his brother. 
I mean Simon Peter who stood on the day of Pentecost plugged into heaven and he confronted the very people that had nailed Christ to the cross and preached about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the true gospel of Christ. And when he finished taking them to Calvary and to an empty tomb and to the right hand of the Father and said Christ is up on high and has made his enemies his footstool, the people were so moved he didn't even have time to say every head bowed, every eye closed as the instrumentalist take their place and we begin to sing just as I'm he didn't even get to the invitation the people began to shout what 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 can we do what can we do and 3,000 people converted and baptized how on earth do you top that what's your name Andrew Andrew you know Simon Peter's brother he also lived in the shadow of his business partners James and John it's interesting when you go through the New Testament that Peter, James, and John were given privileges nobody else were given. For instance, uh, there was that time on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus went up on the mountain, left most of the disciples down there in the valley. Went up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. Andrew's not on the mountain. Peter, James, and John are on the mountain. He, he's down there at the foot of the mountain with the rest of the apostles. Who's that guy standing over there with the apostles? You know, Andrew, Simon Peter, the guy that's on top of the mountain with Jesus, Simon Peter's brother. Remember, Jairus' daughter died, and when Jesus arrived, he said, Peter, James, and John, you're going in me. Andrew was left outside. This happened over and over and over and over again. And then what about Gethsemane? The disciples get to Gethsemane, and he says, all right, and y'all stay right here and pray. And then he says, Peter, James, John, you come with me. We're going a little deeper in the garden. I want to tell you what so blesses me about this man. He spent his whole life with a shadow ministry, living in the shadow of bigger personalities. People had, who had more prominent platforms to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. This man inspires me because he could care less about position. He could care less about the limelight. He could care less about anyone's attention. He was just interested in serving Jesus. He had a shadow ministry. The second thing I want you to notice about him is he had a full heart. He had a full heart. Now, a lot of people couldn't have handled this. I have to examine my own heart. I mean, to spend your whole life introduced like that, this is Andrew Simon Peter's brother. Having to stand there going, they're going up on the mountain and I'll just stay down here and they're going into the garden and I'll just stay here and just go into Jairus' house there. Just go into that room. Nothing but a bunch of clicks. I'm telling you, that church down there, nothing but a bunch of clicks. And, and uh, they never let me sing a solo. And it's because you can't sing. You know, I'll just let, let me just break it to you right here. And <laughs> never let me teach. And never, I, I've never gotten any attention. And, you know, you know, preachers can get like that. Never... Never, I've never preached at the Southern Baptist Convention, and they've never let me preach at that Bible conference. And, and uh, if you're not careful, the old devil will mess with your mind, and you will lose sight of what ministry is all about, and you'll get in the flesh, and you'll begin to nurse your ego. And I'm telling you, my friend, that is the kiss of death. It's amazing what God can do through folks who don't care who gets the glory and who don't care who gets the credit, because all that matters is that one day we stand before our Lord and say, Savior Jesus Christ and he says well done good and faithful servant and when he hands out them crowns we're not going to wear them around and brag about it I got more crowns than you got no siree with the leadership of the four and twenty elders we're going to take those crowns and lay them at the feet of Jesus and sing amazing grace and say Lord it's only by your grace that I'm even saved and if I did anything that was worthwhile it was all because of you it was nothing to do with me so he had no jealousy. 
He had no envy. It didn't make him mad that they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration without him. It didn't make him mad that they went to Jairus' house and went into that bedroom without him. It didn't make him mad that they went all the way into the innermost part of Gethsemane. Because I said he had a full heart. His heart was so full of the love of Jesus that there was no room for jealousy and envy and bitterness. I'm going to tell you what. He got saved and he never got over it. See, the Bible says up there in the book of John chapter 1, in verse 35, again, the next day John stood with two of his disciples. Now, one of those was Andrew. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, one being Andrew, heard him speak, and they followed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that an awesome thing? He heard this mighty gospel preacher just preach the cross. Here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And God got a hold of him because he knew he was a sinner. And when he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the devil moved out and Jesus moved in. He got out of the family of the devil into the family of God, out of darkness into light. He never got over getting saved. He couldn't believe God would save a sinner like him. He got up every morning saying, Lord, Lord, it is amazing you ever saved my sorry soul to begin with. And any blessing I get is just icing on the cake. And if you never did anything again for me except save me from hell, I've got enough motivation to serve you until the day I die. And the problem with many of us is we get to the place that we forget what it's all about. Christ saved us. And as an act of gratitude, we serve him and we don't care where he puts us that's his choice we point everybody to him because it's all about him and it's not about us never got over getting saved Man, he got gripped by that, and he got so full of the Lord Jesus Christ that love crowded out any jealousy that might be there and he just was one of these guys that dared to be himself isn't it pitiful to watch somebody and you know they're trying to be somebody that God never intended them to be? And God wants you to be you full of Jesus. He doesn't want you to try to be somebody else, to try to imitate somebody else. I did that. It don't work. I got in a pickle doing that one time. When I first got called to preach, I was raised up in northwest Texas. And uh, all the evangelists back in the 70s wore white suits in the summer. And I bought me a white suit. I had white shoes and had a big, wide, white tie. And I, I wanted my hair to look like evangelist hair. So I teased it up. I washed with baby shampoo because my hair is kind of flat. And I had that evangelist hair. And, and, man, I got me a sermon on the rapture. All those preachers had sermons on the rapture. You know, the saved are taken, the lost are left behind. And those cars without drivers are hurtling down the interstates. Planes are falling out of the sky. And I got me a sermon on the rapture. And I heard about a great evangelist that would end his sermon on the rapture. He would jump back, cup his ear, and shout, What's that I hear? Is it a trumpet? Is it a shout? And then he would say, The next sound you hear. Maybe the second coming of Jesus. I said, man, I'm going to add that to my repertoire. I'll have all kinds of people saved. I went out to the Middlewell Community Church, a little church outside of the town where I was raised out there in the ranch land. Didn't have any air conditioning, had all the windows up, no screens on it. About 25 people there. I arrived resplendent in my white suit. My hair teased up. I felt like I was at a Billy Graham crusade. I listened to all these preachers, and I just had just put them all together. I was going to try that little twist for the first time I heard that preacher use. I stood up there before those folks like there were 50,000 people. I was sweating like a hog in the sunshine. There was one little boy in the middle, only one little kid, freckle-faced boy. He was up there watching these little sparrow birds that were flipping and flopping up in the rafters as I was thundering about the rapture. I said, the saved are going to be taken, the lost are going to be left behind. I'm telling you what my friend planes are going to be falling out of the sky cars are going to be hurtling down the highway plowing into the lost people that are left behind and all of a sudden I leaped back and I cut my ear and I said what's that I hear but before I could finish the kid jumped up and said it's in birds preacher it's in birds 
Well, I calmed my hair down and put away my white suit. And this is what I found. God just wants me to be me. Just me. Just the person he created me to be. Uh, you see, here, here's a man who understands he's not going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ on another man's gifts. He understands he's got a place to fulfill in the kingdom work of Jesus Christ. He understands at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, it's going to be about being faithful. Were you faithful to do what God called you to do where God called you to do it? So I just wanted you to notice he had a shadow ministry. I wanted you to notice he had a full heart. But here's the third thing I want you to notice. This man, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he had an extraordinary life an extraordinary life. Think about the people he touched. See, here's a man whose gifting was in a conversation about Jesus. We have no record that he ever preached a great sermon, but he had this knack of talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he, 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 he could enter into a conversation with anybody, and in just a little bit, they always ended up with the Lord Jesus Christ, his own brother, when he got saved, the Bible says in verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found, notice the conviction. He's, he's saved and he's sure. He says, we have found the Messiah. And verse 42 says, he brought him to Jesus. Now I want you to notice what he didn't do. And this is a good lesson about having a conversation with somebody about the Lord. You know, evidently Simon Peter could cuss because when he denied the Lord and somebody said, no, you're one of his disciples, he cussed a blue streak just to demonstrate he wasn't a disciple of Christ. And, and, and the very work that he was involved in, those men, you know, they, they had salty language. So his brother didn't say, you need to go and meet this Jesus because you need to clean up your mouth. You got a foul, nasty mouth, and I've gotten saved, and I'm just telling you right now, you need to change the way you talk. See, this is the way it is in the church. We want people to act saved before they get saved. And when these lost people come in and they're not acting saved, everybody gets tore up. What we need to do to reach a lost and dying world is we need to let the Holy Spirit of God not only help us catch the fish, but leave it to him and the sanctifying power of the word of God to clean the fish that he catches. He just says, I, I want you to come and, and meet a man named Jesus. He's the Messiah. You, you know, we find him having a conversation over in John chapter 6. Remember all those thousands of people that were out there listening to Jesus? The day was late and they were hungry. There were no restaurants. And Jesus begins to test the faith of his disciples and says, how are we going to feed these folks? And the scripture says that there was a lad with a lunch. But did you ever notice how he was discovered? The Bible says in John 6... In verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who's got five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they? That's kind of a timid question. What are they among so many? Out of all those people, who was it that found the only person that had food and it was a kid? Andrew, an extraordinary life. The ordinary used to do the extraordinary. And to think that he convinced this kid to give up his lunch. Three sons, when they were little, if they had a couple of pieces of candy, they wouldn't have given it to their other brother no matter what. I'd have to threaten, I'm going to beat you half to death. Give him a piece of your candy. And yet they're sitting around here, how are we going to eat? And here comes Andrew from the crowd, and he's got this little boy, and he's got his lunch. He says, well, look what I found. We got a lad with a lunch. 
Now, folks, we think about the fact that Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes. We think about the lad that relinquished his lunch into the hands of the Lord. We even think about the disciples that went around and fed everybody and then each got a basket full of leftovers. But sometimes we forget that the miracle started when an average, ordinary believer just went out and had a conversation with a young boy about Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, a third time he had a conversation with somebody is over in the Gospel of John chapter 12. And these Greeks, uh, foreigners, they were foreigners. They came to Philip and they said in John chapter 12, verse 21, they said, sir, we would see Jesus. Well, they're foreigners. And Philip didn't know what to do with these foreigners, these Greeks. So he came, guess who? And told Andrew... And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus and brought these Greeks face to face with the living Christ. We think that it's Simon Peter who got that vision on the top of Simon the Tanner's house that went to the house of Cornelius that first touched the Gentile world. No, it was an ordinary man that never got any attention that said, I know what to do with these Gentiles. Come with me. You need to meet Jesus Christ. So stop beating yourself up, driving yourself crazy, feeling crummy every week because you hear somebody brag about how big and bad their ministry is. Just be content to be who you are, serving Jesus Christ where he's put. Just keep teaching that class and singing in that choir and singing for the Lord from church to church and evangelizing Brother Bob from church to church. Just keep pastoring. Just keep serving. Just keep doing the work of God and just be content in being one of those ordinary people who God is using for eternity to do extraordinary things. You know, Edward Kimball is a man most people have never heard of. And he was ordinary, but why did God do something extraordinary? He had a young man in his Sunday school class in Boston he got burdened for. He went to visit him at the shoe shop where he was working. He paced back and forth in front of the shoe shop, getting up his nerves to go talk to this young man. And when he got into the stock room back where that young man was stocking shoes back there. He put his hand on his shoulder and he began to talk to him about Jesus and about being saved. That young man's name, and Dwight L. Moody would later say that when Mr. Kimball left the shoe store, he could still feel the warmth of his hand upon his shoulder. Of course, Dwight L. Moody got saved through that simple witness in that shoe shop, became a mighty evangelist. And one day, a man named F.B. Meyer was sitting there listening to Dwight L. Moody, and God so inspired him that he surrendered to ministry and launched a national ministry coast to coast and became a prolific Christian author. Well, there was a college student listening to F.B. Meyer preach. And his name was J. Wilbur Chapman, and he got saved. And he became a flaming evangelist, and he decided he needed help, so he hired a young man that had just gotten saved out of professional football, whose name was Billy Sunday, and mentored him and taught him everything he knew about evangelism. Well, Billy Sunday went to Charlotte, North Carolina, and held a great crusade that shook the city. Some of the businessmen in that meeting were so moved and so shaken by that crusade, they said, we need to have another crusade crusade like we had with Billy Sunday. And so they secured the services of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham got up there and was preaching the gospel. One night he gave the invitation and there was a teenage boy at the altar asking Jesus Christ to come into his heart as his personal savior. And his name was Billy Graham and the rest is history. But it all started in a shoe store in a back room with somebody who not only didn't have a product table, nobody's ever heard about him but he did what God told him to do so be faithful be humble be joyful get up every morning and rise and shine and give God the glory God bless you